In this episode of Travelog, we venture to the incomparable oasis city of Dunhuang. We'll visit the visually spectacular grottos of the Morgal Caves, soar above legendary sand dunes, and relive the lives of those who once travelled the Silk Road. Travelling towards a dream, a dream built upon the glories of the Silk Road, a dream of an oasis city in the middle of the desert that brought around the ideas, religion and art of ancient civilizations and captured the hearts of people all around the world, including my own. I'm Turan, welcome to Travelogue and welcome to Dunhuang. Dunhuang lies in the northwest of China in Gansu province. Today it's just a three hour flight from Beijing and in ancient times it sat on a critical part of the Silk Road, the Hexi Corridor. It was through here that trade left China and went west to Europe. It made Dunhuang an oasis where fantastic ideas were born and dreams turn real. This entire place is the number one reason people come to Dunhuang. This is the Morgal Caves and it comprises of hundreds of Buddhist grottos and it's here that you can see how Chinese history, how Chinese civilization, religion has developed over thousands of years. And to be honest, it's all a bit mind-blowing. So I've got my ticket, but uh, there is one thing you need to know. Unfortunately, you're not allowed to bring any bags, any phones, any cameras, no iPhones inside, so you can only see it with your eyes, but I'll tell you how amazing it is when I'm back out. <laughs> For 17 centuries, the 735 grottos of the Morgal Caves have been protected by the extreme dryness of the surrounding desert. For over a thousand years, monks carved elaborate shrines in the cliff face with funds from donors. Inside, the artwork showed how the Silk Road brought East and West together. Buddhist statues with elements from ancient Greece and Phaetian, Hindu and Buddhist goddesses with wings like angels. By the 14th century, the caves had been abandoned, but in the 1900s, the major powers of the world raced to Dunhuang, sending explorers like Aurel Stein. A secret cave had been discovered, filled with Silk Road manuscripts, and this time, the whole world was watching. It's like you can see the entire tapestry of the Silk Road laid on the walls here. I just came out of uh, a cave over there that was from the uh, North Way period around one and a half millenniums ago. And you could see, it's, it's absolutely amazing. You could see all of these murals with Buddhist stories. And it just blows your mind away to think that you can pretty much see Chinese history in the making, how everything has come together to form this beautiful, this beautiful complex of grottos. I recommend doing some homework before coming here. It makes a huge difference. Today, Morgal Caves treasures are spread across multiple countries, many in the museums of Britain, France and Germany. But one of the best ways to learn about Dunhuang is through local artists, people who've grown up with the grottos. <laughs> Tanto 
几个世纪的演变以后呢，基本上就是汉化了。像这个典型的这个唐代的四十五过，哎，像这个就就像这个一个贵妇人，你看她这个线条比较活泼 S 型的造型。比较优美，这个就可以说是莫高窟的代表作了，大家都认识这个四十五窟。Our sculptor, Mr. Lu, opened this factory because of his love for the Mughal caves. It takes time and dedication to create these sculptures, since everything is made by hand. This family-run business also hires disabled people and people from impoverished backgrounds, helping to give back to the local community. Meanwhile, I'm here to visit another talented artist. Ah, that's the uh, famous Master Li there working on his art there. This is what we're doing now. This is the painting of the Mughal Kuh, Yulin 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 Kuh, 我们知道中国传统的这种绘画，它主要就是以线造型；西方呢，就是啊以色或者以面造型。这幅作品当中，这个线条，它就是所有的粗细不匀的线条组成了这幅画。当我们呢就把这幅画用线条把它勾完的时候呢，它基本上就是百分之八十的完成了。To make his paintings as faithful as possible to the original fresco, Mr. Li goes to the mountains that house the Yulin grottoes. There, he finds the same minerals to use in his paint as those used in the original centuries ago. Right, time to head to the Dunhuang Art Theatre for some evening entertainment. So it's not enough just to see the Phaeton on the frescoes at Dunhuang, but you've got to see them in real life too. These lovely ladies are Phaeton, or Apsaras, as they're known in English. Apsaras are celestial nymphs found in Buddhism and Hinduism, and often on the ceilings of Morgal Cave's grottoes. We're watching a fight between good and evil, a modern interpretation of one of the Buddhist stories found in the grotto frescoes. Ah, the star of the show, the thousand-armed Goddess of Mercy. I bet they would have been pretty impressed with Dunhuang's night market too. Open every day, except during sandstorms. The night market is a great place to pick up some handcrafted Dunhuang souvenirs from the local artists. There we go, we've got silk from Dunhuang and uh, it's the famous Feitian dancers, the angels of Morgar Cage, that you can even find little leather boots, of course, for deserts in the Silk Road. And we can find pretty much everything here. There's also plenty of food to be found here in the market. And while I was out looking for a late night snack, I bumped into some guys from France. They tell me they're a group of 93 cyclists, with the oldest over 80 years old and that they're biking through China. We've agreed to meet up tomorrow. Coming up next, we'll cheer on a different kind of Silk Road caravan, fly like an eagle across a sea of sand, and sample a rather unique local delicacy. In this episode of Travelog, 
we venture to the incomparable oasis city of Dunhuang, we'll visit the visually spectacular grottos of the Morgal Caves, soar above legendary sand dunes, and relive the lives of those who once travelled the Silk Road. It's 5 a.m. and we're here to see off the French cyclists. Incredibly, over a period of five months, they're going to cycle 14,000 kilometers from Beijing all the way to London. It's a Herculean feat of stamina, and today they're cycling 130 kilometers to reach their next destination. Premièrement, on a fait une très belle visite hier avant hier matin dans les grottes de Mokao. C'était une visite formidable. Euh, J'ai jamais vu un truc pareil qui, qui de, date de si vieux, de si longtemps. Et puis l'accueil et cette ville moderne. Hein. On a passé un très bon séjour à Douang. C'est une ville euh, qui est très attirante pour les touristes. Il y a plein de choses à faire, plein de choses à visiter. Alors on peut y passer quelques jours très agréablement. On se très animé. Hein, et puis, euh, ben, dommage de repartir maintenant. Comme on va rouler, euh, on va rouler ensemble pendant un petit moment. Hey, <laughs> you doing good? You know, I think it's fantastic what these guys do. I mean, hundreds of years ago, you had people on the Silk Road with caravans of camel and, of course, bringing jade and whatnot. Now, in the modern day, it's a different kind of caravan. I mean, you've got a caravan of cyclists, but they're bringing not only their culture and the language, but, of course, bringing lots and lots of memories along this trip as well. So you've got a modern-day Silk Road right here, right now. Bon voyage. Not far from town are the Mingxia Dunes, one of the main attractions of Dunhuang. Stretching on for over 40 kilometers, they're a startling reminder that Dunhuang really is a desert oasis. And inside all this sand is the crescent moon spring. Incredibly, it's never been filled over despite all the sandstorms. No doubt a relief for early Silk Road travelers. Yeah, actually, I read a couple of books about the region. Okay. About Oral Stein. He stayed here for, I don't know, 40, 50 years. And he actually died yeah. on his way going to Kabul. You're enjoying his footsteps, oh, has it? <laughs> it's really a gorgeous place, yeah. very unique. Ah, <laughs> oh. see? If you're going to come to Dunhua, you've got to ride camels. You can't come here without riding camels. I mean, it's like going to Beijing without going to the Forbidden City. And if you're in the desert, these are the best guys to get you around. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> It's an amazing feeling to be out on the dunes, but do make sure you stay hydrated. Ample sun cover is a must, since the sunlight also reflects off the sand. The wild, vast desert. I have to say, it's almost hard to believe that you could find a desert this big, just within three kilometers of town. I mean, it's almost within a stone's throw. But it just goes to show that Dunhuang was such an important oasis city back on the Silk Road. I mean, even to this day, people are still flocking here to get on the camel caravans. Why? Vast desert. Oh, Dunhuang, you are mine. This desert fills me with a sense of awe. But for explorers like Aurel Stein, every day must have been a struggle between life and death. I'm flying in the air, but so far, not yet. Okay? Okay. 
We're ready to go and we have lift off. General Travelog, bam! We are ready for... This is the ultimate experience. Hang gliding over the Min Sha Dunes. Although it feels like I'm sitting on a shaky motorbike with wings, the view is unparalleled. The immense desert. And the infallible present moon spring. Definitely the ride of my life. But if you prefer a more grounded view of the dunes, head on over to the Silk Road Dunhuang Hotel. See, one of the great things about good hotel design is that you can get a, uh, a nice mix of modern and traditional all in one place and that actually still have it fit in properly. I mean, if you look up there, you've got these kind of modern murals of both Chinese side of the Silk Road and the ancient Greek side of the Silk Road. I mean, you can see all of the Chinese emperors and whatnot. And uh, over there, you've got lots of Roman columns. You can see the Terracotta Army. And I was looking at this earlier. You can even see the pyramids of Egypt, the Sphinx. So this place basically has the entire Silk Road route completely within this hotel. For me, the best part of this hotel is its view. Thanks to its location at the edge of the desert, it's perfect for admiring the dunes at your own pace, especially around sunset. I'm starving. Time to refuel. I'm here to try a local delicacy, donkey noodles. Admittedly, this would be the first time for me to eat donkey. But the real reason why this dish is so popular is because of its noodles. To make it extra elastic, a local desert plant called Peng Hao is added to the dough. This makes the noodles so strong they can be stretched at the end of the room, like so. The end result is a perfect bowl of al dente noodles that apparently also help digestion. I can't wait to dig in. So every place has its own specialty. Beijing has the Peking duck. And if you've come to Dunhuang, you've got to come to, to try their donkey noodles, which to some might sound a bit strange, but I think, you know, when in Rome, you've got to try everything. Jigger shoes, the donkey's rib cage bit. That's, uh, that's got to be quite tender, I think. I'm jiggling them. Oh, I think this one's probably the best of all of them. But, of course, the most important part of donkey noodles. And I saw them do this downstairs. Absolutely amazing. Come on, guys. Uh, all of us, and you in particular, you've been the most tired of all. The restaurant is always packed come dinner time. So make sure you come early if you want to give it a try. As for us, we're heading to Dranchuko village to watch some opera. <laughs> I could already hear the music just down the street, but usually after dinner, you could always find farmers and uh, little kids on the outskirts of Dunha making their own fun, having a little bit of entertainment inside. So let's go and watch. <laughs> we're watching Tzu Zisi, grassroots opera. The opera is based on everyday events and popular throughout northwest China. Here in Dunhuang, it's sung in the local dialect, a mix of immigrant languages thanks to Dunhuang's colorful past. Uh, it's great, I mean, I, uh, I can understand maybe 5% of what they're doing. Uh, they've lost some cows 
and they've lost some sheep. Whoa. <laughs> But I think it's great, you know, it's less about the performance but more about the community environment. Everyone's friends, everyone's neighbours, it's fantastic. It's just a great way to enjoy life after dinner. Coming up next, we head towards the old western frontier of China. But not before we discover the ruins of an ancient city and check out an oasis in the middle of the desert. We're on our way to the Yangguan Pass, built near the start of the Silk Road. But first, let's make a quick pit stop here at the West Thousand Buddha Caves. Whoa! <laughs> cool! Hey, now this is what I call a grotto. Uh, back in the days, on the Silk Road, this western side of the Thousand Buddha Caves was directly on the route from Dunhuang to Yangguan, which back then was at the westernmost edge of China. If you left Yangguan, it was a completely different world out there, outside of Chinese territory. And people, monks, travellers, traders, would always spend a night here. It was basically their last refuge before heading into a brave new world. I'm from Austria. You're from Austria? It's in Europe. Yeah. Not Australia, it's Austria. <laughs> <laughs> what made you decide to come to Dunhua? Oh, that's a long story. I'm coming relatively often to China because I like China. And Dunguan is uh, more or less an old project of mine because some years ago I read in National Geographic about the caves of Dunguan. What do you think about the environment of this place? This environment over here, I think that's absolutely great because that's original. Like it was a thousand years ago, 800 years ago, I don't know. Further out west and close to Yangguan Pass, is the Wawa Pond. It's an oasis sitting in the middle of the desert, surrounded by some truly striking scenery. Thanks to its natural springs, it's a haven for local wildlife and the shepherds that tend to their flocks here. But most importantly, it's an essential source of water in an otherwise arid region. The reason why Dunhong and every single oasis city on the Silk Road were placed where they were, it's very simple, it's because of water. Because without water, you can't have life. It's essential for humans, for animals, for plants, for everything. And every single city that thrived was because of this one simple thing. Of course, you need something to guard it, and that's why Yangguan was placed there, over in the northwest, and also why the town nearby has flourished too. This was the site of Longlu, a town that once flourished during the Han Dynasty, 2,000 years ago. Tang 这个城池有十一万多平方米 town was once a thriving center for trade. My guide tells me that an archaeological excavation is being planned. But if I were to grab a shovel now and dig anywhere, I'd likely find valuable pieces of history buried beneath the sand. But we're finally here, the road to Yangguan Pass. 
The pass was once the final frontier of China, and all that lay beyond was an unknown world full of danger, opportunity, and adventure. Hey, you look familiar. Ah, from where are you? Oh, I came from Beijing. Where? Uh, just want to go to London. London? No. The camera is not China's. No, 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 no. It's our own. There we go. Off to the big wide world. I'm ready for it all. I've got my passport. I've got my horse. I've even decorated him. He's so beautiful. And all I need now is to get out of. I've got my passport. Look. See? Yeah. All I need now is to get out of this door. I grab my stamp. And I'm ready to go. It's a big wide world out there, and it's all for me to discover. Thank you. See ya. Time to discover the world. Do you know, I think I've completely rediscovered the Silk Road again. I mean, I can now see why all of the foreign explorers, Orel Stein and everyone, came here with so much passion. Why the Morgul Caves were built in such huge glory. But I think, as for me, it's about time to get back on the road. Thanks for watching Travelog. See you next time.